Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, Frayne Olson will look at planning acre projections and key January crop reports. Roger Wilson will analyze 2013 Nebraska crop budgets. Brad Lubin will outline important policy issues for the next year. Dave Gaylor will explain the beginning farmer tax credit. And Greg Iba will discuss how his recent trip to China could yield investments in Nebraska. Frayne Olson from North Dakota State is our marketing analyst this week. Key USDA crop reports coming out soon could provide a significant shakeup to commodities especially corn. Possibly the most anticipated number is that of corn stocks. If it's low, the new estimates from Informa Economics could help. Its new projection shows U.S. farmers will plant 99 million acres of corn this year. Acres for wheat and soybeans were both lowered, but overall, Informa Economics sees a big total for those three crops. Their estimate is around 220 million acres. As analysts begin to look at the 2013 crop, we asked Frayne if that large of a number is even possible. Well, you have to do a little bit of creative counting to get there, and it is possible. Um, you know, we're looking at a, at a, depending upon who you listen to, you're looking at about an, uh, one to one and a half million bush, uh, acre increase in, in corn. There's, uh, some are saying one and a half million acre increase in soybeans and a potentially two million acre increase in wheat. Um, so we're looking on the margin compared to last year, a, a little over 5 million acres and kind of the issue is where do we come up with those and if you, if you look around a little bit saying well we can steal a little bit from cotton and I think most people given the current price relationships between cotton and the major competing crops are thinking about probably a 2 or to 2, million, two and a half million acre decrease in cotton acreage. And the one that people often forget about is the CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. And when you look at the acres that did not get re-enrolled, we're already looking at about 2.6 million acres of additional cropland that will now come into production in 2013. And a, a big portion of those acres, um, the, the farmers that did uh, you know, look at those acres were not intending to re-enroll them. And so they can easily be brought back into cropland. And no doubt some tic-tac acres, maybe making some yards shorter and some fields wider. Uh, could drought conditions change that at all? Anything that would change, you know, if they plant a different crop or not a crop at all? Well, one of the extra things we need to be watching ab uh, about is, is, of course, the winter wheat uh, uh, plantings, which we'll, we'll know a little bit more about that in, in January. We also have some concern about the possible winter wheat killing, or the winter kill in the winter wheat crop. And... A, where would those acres go to if they did winter kill? What crop would be replanted into them? And would that put additional pressure on the wheat market to try and buy some additional spring wheat acres up here in the northern plains? And again, some of the acres that everybody's counting on for additional corn and soybeans are going to be in the uh, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota region. And so there, there will be an interesting mix as we get into spring's work. We'll at least see some big numbers coming out from South America, or we expect to see some big numbers coming out from South America before this U.S. crop goes into the ground. Uh, any changes there with uh, soybeans maybe swaying to or from corn? Yeah, and that is also one of the issues we need to be watching very closely. Currently, if you look at the, the forward pricing opportunities for 20, 2013, both corn and soybeans, the assumption that's currently built into those numbers is that we're going to have a very large corn and soybean crop out of South America. 
In fact, if you look at the numbers, this would be a record large crop in both Brazil and Argentina. So the question becomes, what happens if they have an adequate yield or a, a, a more normal yield or acreage instead of the, the large acreage and production that we're, look, we're expecting right now? And of course, if they have a shortfall in their production, that means that we have to buy some more acres up here in North America. And again, that would really change the dynamics because the current price relationships and, and the current bidding for acres, if you will, that's going on right now is assuming a very large South American crop. So if that comes up a little short, that means we have to buy some more acres up here, and that does change the mix quite a bit. We'll have some reports coming out soon. Uh, next week, WASD quarterly stocks, some yield expectations from the old crop. Uh, there's going to be a lot of chatter around this report. How volatile could that make markets? Well, what I'm trying to tell farmers is that those set of reports, the combination of those reports, will really be the reset button when it comes to pricing and price expectations. And I do think there will be some unexpected uh, uh, numbers that come out in that. What's, what's going to be the net result? Of course, we don't know right now. But um, the, the, we'll get some final production numbers when it comes to the corn and soybean crop. We'll have the official numbers for the winter wheat seedings report. And one of the most important in my mind is going to be that quarterly stocks report. Because that will be the first real read we have on how quickly we're using up the corn crop. And in particular, how much of that, at least through an implied sense, how much of that corn is going into the feed sector. What is your expectation on the winter wheat seeding? I think the winter wheat seeding, the, the private estimates for winter wheat seeding I think are reasonably close. The, the question of course the wheat market will be watching very very closely is as we get in more into the March April time period and that winter wheat breaks dormancy, uh, how many of those acres actually experience some winter kill problems, what are the yield expectations at that point. And, and again, the, the drought and the drought monitor uh, um, issues are all going to be part of that concern. I'm going to close with this frame. Wheat, corn, soybeans, they each have their fuels. Wheat with the uh, drought conditions, corn with the ending stocks, and soybeans with South American conditions. Uh, what's your advice for trying to uh, keep an even stomach here or a settled stomach as you try to market each commodity? Yeah, well, I, I jokingly say that farmers are going to have nerves of steel or, or will have to have nerves of steel as they move forward and trying to put some marketing plans together. But I guess the underlying question I'm trying to ask is, or have, have farmers answer, is uh, what are the odds or probabilities that prices will go up versus the odds that, or probability prices will go down? And, and if you can help sort that through and make an informed decision about what's going on, it should help remove some of the emotion and hopefully you make a better decision. The reports for grain stocks, winter wheat seedings, and supply and demand estimates are all set for release on Friday morning. The 2013 Nebraska Crop Budgets estimates are out. There are 53 budgets for 16 different crops in the state. Last year's numbers saw a 15% increase, and Roger Wilson says 2013 will see movement in the same direction. For the most part, they're up again. Uh, that's, I think, no surprise, right. but it is kind of a major story. And I think the reasons they're up uh, is um, varied from last year a little bit. I know last year we talked about mm -hmm. the reason they were up was because uh, we'd increase the cost of machinery quite a bit. That's not the story this year. This year the reason they're up is because uh, the seed's higher, except for a couple of exceptions. Herbicide prices are higher, except for a couple of exceptions. And the things that have really gone up quite a bit is our real estate costs. This for Nebraska, this is 16 crops, by the way, I should mention. Yes, we have, there are 16 different crops in this set of budgets and 53 budgets. So there are some crops where we have multiple budgets. Uh, we have to have different budgets for the dryland corn versus the irrigated right. corn. And we also have different budgets for the gravity irrigated corn compared to the pivot irrigated corn. So they all have different budgets, and sometimes there gets to be quite a few budgets for each of the crops. <laughs> and they're uh, across the state, so corn is the same uh, from east Nebraska to west Nebraska, the budget. Uh, yes, that's right. They, they used to do budgets by district, mm -hmm. but uh, we're not doing them by district now. Uh, the costs are pretty much the same. Uh, and w these are just cost budgets. We don't do any returns, so even though the uh, yields vary throughout the state. We're not dealing with returns. Uh, there is one difference though that we really don't account for and that's as you move across the straight west you have to put on more irrigation water. So our irrigation budgets uh, we kind of pick 
something we think is represented kind of in the middle. Right. And uh, people can adjust those budgets where they put on more or less water. Well, middle might be best case scenario <laughs> yeah. this year. Let's talk about some of the good things. Fertilizer prices down. Fertilizer prices are down, except for anhydrous. Uh, we go out and we ask the dealers. We have some friends who are dealers, and they will share their information. We don't with the and we don't share their names, and uh, so they think that the, for the most part, fertilizer prices are going to be down, uh, except for anhydrous. It appears it's going to be up. The two big ones that are rising, real estate and crop insurance. We'll get to crop insurance in okay. a second. The interesting thing you told me about real estate is you're looking at last year's, essentially. Yeah, we like to base these budgets on, on surveys. And, of course, this only, pardon me, the latest survey we have yep. uh, is the survey that was done last year. And Bruce Johnson's doing a survey this year that we're not going to have until about June. So we base our budgets on last year's survey. And the price of real estate was up quite a bit last year. And... It'll probably be up quite a bit this year. Yeah, you don't like want it. to see those numbers. <laughs> crop insurance, it's uh, specific to each county. Is that correct? Yeah, the crop insurance, we, we did it a different way this year. Before, we kind of thought we used a number mm -hmm. that we kind of thought was a representative number. This year, we went on a website that the uh, Risk Management Agency has, and we put some numbers in, and there's the uh, rates are vary from county to county. So we tried to use some representative counties for corn and soybeans. We used uh, Buffalo County. Uh, for wheat, we used Keith County. And we tried to pick a county that was representative of that type of crop. Overall, corn, soybeans, wheat all up? Our, our numbers are pretty much up uh, this year. We're using the higher numbers this year for crop insurance. Seed-wise? Was he really looking seed at for rise, cost most there? of the seeds are higher. There are a few that are lower, a couple. Uh, apparently Roundup Ready 2 soybean seeds down and, and sorghum safe and seed is down. But other than that, they're either the same or higher. The 2013 Nebraska crop budgets can be found on the CropWatch website. We'll also link to that information through the Market Journal homepage. The end of 2012 brought incredible uncertainty, both inside and outside of agriculture. Ag waited for movement on a farm bill the entire year, including a missed deadline at the end of September. Fiscal cliff discussions filled markets with uncertainty, which spread into the markets for ag commodities. Now into 2013, the industry is keeping its eye on potential regulations, and as Brad Lubin said when we talked at the end of December, there are also other federal fiscal issues to keep in mind. Well, clearly one of the issues ag will look at in 2013 is, regardless of whether we solve the fiscal cliff in December, regardless of whether we attach the farm bill to it or not, we still have tremendous fiscal issues to address uh, in, in, uh, in D.C. in the coming year. Continued budget discipline could affect spending for some uh, favored ag programs, including crop insurance, mm -hmm. uh, but it more substantially might affect financial markets and what confidence the financial markets have in uh, the U.S. government to maintain any fiscal discipline and, and budget compromise. Without that financial market confidence, you'll see interest rates react, mm -hmm. and you'll see production sectors like agriculture that have uh, enjoyed very favorable interest rates uh, for capital needs over the last few years, mm -hmm. having to respond to uh, potentially a changed uh, financial market. A lot of play there as well in uh, overseas markets when you talk about exports and the sure. strength of the dollar as well. Sure, absolutely. Any sort of financial uncertainty also leads to uncertainty in terms of the value of the dollar. Uh, the value of the dollar can, can sometimes play bad economic news that weakens the dollar actually sometimes makes our commodities more competitive in overseas markets. But financial uncertainty in general hurts market uh, demand globally. What about regulations? What can you look for there for agriculture? Well, clearly that's the other big item on, on ag's uh, radar is, is where is ag relative to uh, regulation? Uh, once you put a farm bill to bed, mm -hmm. uh, the Ag Committees will spend a substantial amount of their time reviewing and monitoring regulatory activity. And Ag has certainly been looking at a laundry list of proposed policies, uh, everything from environmental regs on air and water and biofuels to, uh, to labor regs uh, on, on child labor on, on farm operations that were killed in, in 2012 uh, to other pending regulations. Uh, on everything from biotech uh, crop development to uh, to other environmental issues. Uh, ag is always watching uh, and leery of the, the reach of, of, reg of the regulatory agenda. Are there a few there, a few big ones that agriculture thinks it might lose or thinks that you know it's not going to end up in their right. favor? Well, I think clearly there are some big issues that stay on the radar relating to environmental policy. Uh, the, the potential 
uh, uh, regulation of, of greenhouse gases and, and the potential extension of those proposed regulations right now on large stationary emitters like power plants. Mm -hmm. When and if uh, that transitions to other sources, is agriculture a source of, of emissions that becomes part of a, regulatory, uh, a regulated mm -hmm. industry? Uh, back when legislation was proposed in Congress in 2010, ag was a potential provider of carbon sequestration uh, and maybe a seller of credits. But in a regulatory environment, do we regulate emissions? Do we, do we uh, license credits? Those are big issues that are somewhere down the road here yet, uh, but clearly on the radar. As with the 2012 Farm Bill, we'll continue to follow these key issues in 2013. Tile drainage isn't common in all areas of Nebraska. The drier spots like to keep the moisture that's already in the soil. But in the January Nebraska Farmer, you'll read how and why two Platte Valley farmers installed tile lines in 2012. Both say they've realized higher yields on the tiled fields even in a dry year. You can read more about their experiences in the January Nebraska Farmer. At last week's Soybean Day and Machinery Expo in Wahoo, we talked with Dave Gaylor about the beginning farmer tax credit and options for Nebraska farmers and ranchers close to the retirement age. As you'll hear, that's the majority among this state's farm operators. Well, uh, the largest group is the 35 to 64 group. Uh, and the group that's been increasing is the over 65 group, and the group that's been decreasing is the under 35 group. Do you expect to see that changing at all? I know there's some thought that maybe with high commodity prices that'll bring some people back to the farm. I'm hopeful uh, that, that we'll see uh, some increase in, in the uh, under 35 group. You know, we're, we're in the 3,000 range across the whole state of operators that are in that age group, which is just not very many operators. And, and you know, at the commodity prices and the opportunities that are there, uh, there's been a lot of interest in that in that group, and I'm hopeful that that will show up in our 2012 egg census that's coming out here now shortly. One of the eye-opening stats I saw was, uh, and it's somewhere around half, maybe more, Nebraska farmers don't have wills. What's the repercussion of that? Well, the repercussion is without, a, and I would look at a will as a plan, of course, and without any plan, the repercussion is that uh, you know we all know someday that those assets are going to change hands because we're all going to. We're all mortal and, and someone's going to die. And so when that occurs, if you don't have a plan, then the state of Nebraska tells you what will happen with those assets. And it likely is not going to be uh, exactly the way you would like it to happen. So With those retiring farmers, uh, they have a choice between you know keeping some of their assets, maybe cash renting some of their land, and completely selling it off, putting it somewhere else, using the money to travel, wh whatever it might be. How do you advise farmers to weigh those two options? Well, the thing I always look at is, you know, what are you going to put your money in? You know, I think traditionally what we would see is a situation where a farmer might sell his land and, and maybe move to Phoenix or whatever he might do, and, uh, but there's going to be cash. And, and if the alternative is going to be put it in a CD at one or one half percent interest, you know, that's probably not a very, very handsome return. Uh, cash rents now are probably significantly better than that. Uh, for most operations, so you know, I, I really think that it, it depends on what the alternative is. But uh, you know, if it's just simply putting it in a CD, I don't think it's hard to beat that right now. I'll close with the beginning farmer tax incentive. Uh, how can that help both farmers and uh, landlords who are going to rent land out to a beginning farmer? You know, we have a program in Nebraska called the Beginning Farmer Tax Credit, and it's for owners of agricultural assets that are willing to rent those assets to beginning farmers. And uh, it's uh, for a three-year lease, and the owner of those assets can be a relative. You can lease it to your son or daughter or neighbor or whomever it might be. Uh, and the owner of those assets gets a 10% cash, 10% tax credit for a cash rent and a 15% uh, tax credit for a share rent. Uh, and the, the beginner is qualified by having farmed for less than 10 years and having a net worth of under 200000 so it's, it's a great tool, especially when we're trying to maybe put a little more cash flow into the operation to help account for those years when there's going to be a father and a son, maybe both needing to pull some income out of it. Uh, it's a great tool. We were the first state in the United States to do it. There are others that have followed, uh, but, but I'm real proud that we have that available. And it's, it's a great tool for people. It's Department of Agriculture uh, does all of the administering of that program. And, and so you can just Google the Nebraska Department of Agriculture or the Nebraska Beginning, Beginning Farmer Tax Credit and uh, get all the information right there. To see our full interview with Dave, you can log on to the Market Journal website or YouTube page. 
Representatives from the Nebraska Department of Agriculture recently returned from China, where they had a unique opportunity with the Paulson Institute. We talked with Director Greg Ibaugh about how that trip could benefit the state. Well, uh, former uh, Secretary of Treasury Hank Paulson has formed an institute in Chicago. It's Chicago-based, and it has several working groups within the institute, but one of them is focused on agriculture and trying to work with China on an agricultural level. And this one isn't about, you know, sending our technology to them. Right. It's about bringing their investment to the United States and looking for uh, the opportunity to build jobs, do some manufacturing in the egg space with Chinese investment. Talking about bringing the money over and then maybe finding a new market, whether it be here or in China as well? Yes, and if they would, uh, you know, build an egg processing plant of some type or an egg manufacturing related uh, plant of some type that you know, they could either access then the U.S. market with their products, the world market, because we would have the, the science and safety right. standards in place to, to have access to a world market, or they could take it home to China uh, where they would also have a market uh, for those products. What's the benefit for Nebraska? And first I, sh I should just ask you about Nebraska's role in all this because this is U.S. wide, so what's Nebraska's specific role? Well, Nebraska was uh, the only state that the Paulson Institute invited to this uh, workshop to be able to give a presentation. And part of that's because, uh, you know, I think that we have a strong reputation for working in the international marketplace. Uh, you know, we promote ourselves fairly heavily there. But also I think we've developed a fairly strong reputation over the last few years as being a economically strong state. Mm -hmm. And if you watch where we have climbed in the business favorability ratings over the last few years, uh, you know, we, we're moving right up. And then, you know, some of them were even rated number one place, num number one state to start a new business. Right. And what happens now? I mean, what's the, the additional benefit if, uh, if Chinese investors were to come in into uh, a manufacturing sector of some kind in this state? Well, you know, we're, we're happy and we've had great success sending our raw agricultural commodities to China. And we hope to continue to do that. And I think they're going to be a, a great market for, you know, corn, soybeans, wheat, dry beans for a long time into the future. I think there's also an opportunity, though, for us to look at adding value to those soybeans, corn, wheat, and dry beans, and other uh, crops as well before they leave Nebraska and create jobs and tax base and economic development in some communities across Nebraska and then send finished products over instead of raw materials. What's the timeline for this? Is it in the infancy? Is it at an advanced stage where the investors are ready to go now? What's, uh, what's the prognosis here? I think I would characterize this, uh, the work we did uh, and the meeting we were at is very foundational. I think this is just really uh, you know, the, this concept about bringing ag investment back is, is pretty new to China. It's pretty new within the, the U.S. Uh, as well. And so, you know, we need to you know, learn about what their wants, needs, and expectations might be, and, and they the same. And so, you know, we will work uh, at the Department of Ag to continue to follow up and uh, figure out if we can, you know, turn this into some projects. Now with his weekly weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we are again for the first official forecast of Market Journal in terms of the weather for 2013. And since we've been gone for the last two weeks, bring a briefly update on what has occurred, really not much of anything. The most important weather system moved through the state was on New Year's Eve where we've seen a broad-based area of two to four inches across much of southern Nebraska, south of Interstate 80, and immediately along portions of south central Nebraska along the Kansas border. We've seen totals that approach the seven, eight inch mark. So it's a very welcome moisture. Unfortunately, it missed a lot of northern Nebraska. We had a lot of cold weather that hung in pretty firm over the state, and now that that has released, we're starting to see some gradual warming trend. The question is how long will it last and will we receive any significant moisture in the upcoming forecast period? So let's take a look at the upper models and see whether or not there is any precipitation in the forecast. And I'll draw your attention to this wave that is moving through today. We don't expect much in, in the way of any precipitation. More or less, we're going to see some clouds with a slight cool down in comparison to what we experienced yesterday. And then the system will quickly shift eastward. And as we go into tomorrow, what we're going to notice is the ridge really supplants itself into the central plains. And we should have a 
very nice day on Sunday. In fact, we're probably going to melt quite a bit of snow off as we see temperatures that are going to start to move up into the upper 30s to the low 40s. But I'll draw your attention to a system to the west that is expected to start making its way into our region as we get into Monday. And by the time we get to Monday, you can see this trough digs very deep down into the southwestern United States and is expected to start moving its way toward the northeast. And there's a lot of cold air behind this, so the question becomes, will the cold air get here in time to cause any significant weather problems in Nebraska and it appears that most of this energy will stay south of us and we will just see a few flurries and then that system will start to make its way toward the east of us and we'll see so much cooler air trying to make its way in but it's more of a Pacific Ocean uh, air mass is going to move over the Rockies, so there could be some downsloping and some additional warming across western Nebraska. As we get into Wednesday we'll see some little ridging once again taking place with another fast moving system uh, coming into the western United States. So we are going to see a warm up of temperatures briefly and then we'll see a much more significant warm up as we get into Thursday because the system is going to dive very deep once again into the southern Rockies and we're also going to see a cold polar vortex up in the northern plains and these two are going to emerge and create a pretty potential snowstorm for some portion of the plains. So keep an eye on the weather and the updated forecast because there is a lot of variability where the system is going to uh, develop and it could be a rather significant maker in terms of weather. By the time we get to Friday, that system will all move to the east and notice that we have a very cold northwest flow and we could see some very chilly temperatures moving into our region on Friday. So as we look toward the temperatures, what we're going to notice is for this weekend, we're going to see temperatures basically in the 30s and then on Sunday we're going to warm up and then we'll see temperatures slightly start to cool down on Tuesday with that cold front and then a gradual warm up back up into the 40s to 50s on Wednesday and then we start to see the cool down with the potential for a little bit of light snow toward the end of the week in terms of 8 to 14 days forecast. You can see the cold weather remains in place and in terms of precipitation, it looks like we might see a couple systems making our way through the state in the extended forecast. Thanks, Al. Our interviews from today's shows are available on our website. And for more information from Market Journal during the week, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Next week, we'll take a look at updated drought conditions in the state. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.